Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I know there are other interesting talks now, so I'm very grateful you're here. Um, today I will talk about why feminists should fight for animal rights, and this is, like my friend said, a talk that I usually give to feminist audiences. Um, I've done this so far in Poland to Polish feminist audiences, so it's only my second time presenting this in English. Uh, I'm sorry for any um, troubles with that. So first I will have a brief introduction and then I will uh, give the talk I usually give to feminists in Poland, uh, which consists of an introduction, uh, the interconnections between the two movements, uh, and a brief summary. And then I will proceed to further ways of involving feminists in the animal rights movement, which I have done in Poland and which perhaps can be an inspiration for you. Um, and I will finish off with a take-home message. And the reason, um, well, first about me, um, my friend already mentioned everything that's important. So um, I lead a team of dedicated women who work for animal rights in Poland um, in the Fundacja Liberta Szwajcera. And I'm also a part of the feminist movement. I have been for about 15 years. Um, so why I'm giving this talk? Uh, I strongly believe that the animal movement really needs all the allies it can get. Um, and bringing more people into the movement is crucial. So I've been searching for um, audiences who are very prone to listen to our arguments and to join the movement and who are already experienced in doing other things. Um, and I've discovered through my experience that feminists um, are a great audience for animal rights issues. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that many women or mainly women are involved in the animal rights movement. Um, and the feminists I have spoken to are very open uh, to these arguments. So I've tried to connect these movements in Poland. Um, and this presentation will show uh, how I have used these tactics uh, to involve the feminist movement in Poland. Um, and by showing what arguments I have used, where the interconnections actually are, um, I can hopefully inspire other women and men, of course, uh, to do the same in your countries, because I'm sure you have circles of your own um, within both the feminist movement, but also other movements like LGBTI movements or any other human rights movements, in fact, who can be open to our cause. So why should feminists fight for animal rights? There are many reasons, um, which I'll go to later. Why is it in the best interest of women to have better animal protection laws and for society in general to respect animals? Um, what are the common motives in women's struggles and in the plight of animals in society? And how is our position similar? Also, what connects our two movements? So I will argue that we are guided by the same values, um, that we're deeply connected, and that we actually depend on one another. Uh, we women share a common burden with animals, and I will show you examples of this. And we have the same enemy, which is patriarchy. We also have the same goal, which is ultimately freedom from suffering and its dignity and respect for all. So therefore, solidarity between our movements is necessary um, for both of the movements to achieve our goals. The interconnections I will talk about include objectification, violence, language which connects the two. It's like a kind of bridge between objectification and violence. And finally, inconvenience. Um, this is just a division that I've created, but I'm sure there are many others which are just as good. Um, so I'm sure there are also many other arguments that I won't mention here that you will have and can add maybe in the Q&A session. So I will begin with objectification. Um, in general, those who are stronger take away the subjectivity of those who are weaker. And the very fact that they are weaker is an excuse to use them. So in society, men in general objectify women, um, and people in general objectify animals. So patriarchy and speciesism is very connected. And it is mainly bodies which are objectified. So in society, you can observe that women are often portrayed as sexual objects uh, publicly in society and female bodies are used to advertise anything that you can imagine, from beer, cars, to suits. Uh, I will show you some examples of this. And female body parts are often shown up close in these commercials, um, as if that the women that they belong to aren't actually human, but only consist of these body parts. So women as props, as hostesses, uh, sexualized women in music videos are all something you've seen before, I'm sure. Um, and when I present this to, fem to a feminist audience, this is something they are very aware of. Um, and I will next make the analogy to animals. So women are judged by their looks, mainly, or first of all as a body and later, later as a human being. They're judged by their looks, by whether or not they are mothers, whether they're in age still attractive for men, 
and also historically how useful they are, so whether they can cook, clean, and so on. Um, here are some examples of commercials that I just spoke about with women being objectified as sexual objects. Um, the first one is actually quite shocking. Um, it means in Polish, she knows what will be in her mouth in a second. And the good news is that this commercial, um, the company who made this commercial had to pay a fine for it and had to apologize publicly. But these other commercials you will see, um, nobody has had to apologize for them. And they're considered as something normal or something we are used to in many, many countries around the world. So even here on the right, um, there's an example of a commercial, a social one, about being an organ donor, which should actually be more sensitive to such issues. But it actually says, becoming a donor is probably your only chance to get inside her. And it uses a sexualized image of a woman here too. Some other examples, a car, a suit. You probably know many of these. Um, and here, a vodka commercial, and on the right, believe it or not, it's a meat uh, shop commercial. So. Um, so when I speak to feminists uh, who are well aware of this, I say, analogically, don't you think that animals are treated like things by humans in society? Um, they can be consumed, they can be used for clothing, for fur, for painful experiments, um, for entertainment in sea world, circuses, zoos, you name it. And uh, ironically, they also appear in commercials um, as the happy animals, the happy chickens, happy cows, uh, who only dream of being eaten, of being used uh, as things, as objects. So what I'm saying here um, is that both animals and women live in systems of violence uh, in which their bodies serve somebody else. And this is visible even in our pop culture and our commercials. Um, and I argue when I speak to feminists that by allowing any single group to be objectified, we actually agree to the process of objectification itself. Which means that even if one day for women this ends and remains for animals, it will surely come back one day. If not for women, then for other groups. Um, because we then agree to the process itself in society. So I ask feminists, is, that not, is this not the same as the commercials I just showed you of women? where? also animals are objectified, where their bodies are objects, are things, where an animal encourages us to eat them or to use their milk, their pro which belongs to them and their babies. Um, some other parallels I want to mention here in the process of objectification is that it is in general denying somebody's ability to think, to feel, to need. So women are oftentimes viewed as being closer to animals or more like animals than to men, to humans. Of course, this is more visible in more, some countries than others, in some areas of the world than others, and more in the past than now. Um, we are oftentimes denied rationality or denied much of it. Um, we're said to be guided by hormones, by emotions more than men are. Um, we are also biologized and full of instincts, including the maternal instinct. So of course, we're thought of as being worse leaders, um, unable to take on important roles, not having math, IT talents, or being bad drivers. Of course, we can always man up or grow a pair, then we'll be better at this, so. And analogically with animals, uh, society denies that animals have needs, that they are subjective beings, sentient beings, um, who have their own internal life, social life, empathy, and intelligence. Um, and the treatment of both women and animals show how hierarchical a society we live in. Here are some advertisements that actually managed to offend both animals and women. Um, and believe it or not, the one at the top, the far right, um, is a website of a slaughterhouse, a chicken slaughterhouse in Poland, with a sexualized image of a woman there. So, just to prove the point. Um, of course, we all wish it was more like this, where um, animals are shown as conscious sentient beings. And now I will move to language um, as the second interconnection between uh, the plight of animals and the situation of women in society. So the language, language is in general a bridge between objectification that I just spoke about and violence that I will speak about in a minute. Um, so the first step to justifying violence is objectifying someone and taking away their dignity and rights. And we oftentimes um, don't see how powerful a language, how powerful a tool it is to do this. Um, it becomes okay to hurt someone uh, when they are portrayed as objects or as things, because how can you hurt a thing? How can you hurt something? 
um, and oppressive language towards women and animals is a kind of inevitable part of our society, of a patriarchal society, because women are portrayed as sexual objects, like I said, animals are things that you can use. So in essence, we're both products, um, probably animals even more so than women. And language here is a very, very powerful tool to make this happen. So, for instance, um, when we speak of sexual harassment, our language has a, very, a way of belittling harm done to women in many ways. You probably all know these sayings. I know many more in Polish, but I will give you some examples in English, and probably in your languages there are many more. So women often hear that boys will be boys, and don't be so dramatic. He's basically a good guy, you know, and it's only a compliment. It's just what men do. And to victims of rape, even, what was she wearing that night? Or she was asking for it. To animals, on the other hand, um, and this is where I ask feminists what they think of the term humane killing. Uh, can any killing actually be humane? Is this not the same oppressive language that the one we use towards animals? And what about species regulation that hunters often use, at, in Poland at least? Or when we call dead bodies of animals meat or fur? Uh, or when we count them in kilos or tons instead of as individuals. Uh, another important element uh, is the offensiveness of animal names. Now in Polish there's about 10 to 15 animal names that are very offensive towards women. Um, in English I found a fewer number of this. Um, I will just name a few. So women can be called, men too of course, but oftentimes this is actually women. Uh, a bitch, a cow, a hen, a pig. And there are offensive animal qualities or activities like barking, being bitchy, yapping, and all the vulgar words and expressions you can imagine. And these are actually used mainly towards women in society. In the Polish language, it is that way anyways. Um, maybe you have some examples at hand in your languages, like in German or French. If you do, just shout it out maybe in the Q&A session. Um, so the main question here is, why are animal qualities offensive in the first place? Kind of just like feminine qualities can be. And uh, contempt towards women and animals goes hand in hand. Uh, these are just some of the examples. I'm sure that you know of more. Um, in Poland, some feminists have actually used some of these offensive terms uh, in a good way to turn it around. So there's a big Polish uh, women's strike uh, that you may have heard of. There were very loud protests last year against the anti-abortion law in Poland. Um, and one of the posters encouraging women to come and to sign a petition to appear there uh, used the Polish expression home hen or house hen, which is a kind of um, very offensive way to call a woman who stays at home and who cares for children and doesn't have a career. Uh, so we use this as um, to our advantage and just said, be a home, be a house hen or be a hen and come lay a petition, come lay a protest. Um, and now I will move to violence, which is very strongly connected to language and stems from it. So research has strongly shown that domestic violence uh, is connected to violence towards animals. When I, mean, when I say domestic violence, I mean violence towards women and towards children, because this is what it usually is. So research has been going on in, from the 70s, um, and there are lots of pieces of research which prove this very highly, and there's more and more recently. Um, I can't name all of them here, and I can't go into the details, but I will show you just a few that you can look into yourself. So, first of all, animal abusers are five times more likely to commit violent crimes against people, especially women and children. This is done by the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Um, the American Psychiatric Association uses animal cruelty as one of its diagnostic criteria uh, of conduct disorder and violence towards women. And even FBI profilers use animal abuse as a kind of indication of violent behavior towards humans, especially women, uh, in the future. Also, 71% uh, of battered women uh, in shelters which were researched um, claimed that their abusers, their partners, uh, men also harmed or threatened to harm their domestic animal companion, oftentimes killing the domestic animal companion. This leads to many things. Um, in Poland especially, it is extremely difficult for victims of violence to seek help, to find help. Uh, women are oftentimes ashamed when they are a victim uh, or they are not believed. It's hard to get evidence for certain crimes and people often um, say that it may not be true or disbelieve the victims, and animals obviously can't even file a lawsuit. Um, 
So in Poland, when violence towards both women and animals actually get, makes it to court, makes it to the justice system, judicial system, um, oftentimes courts dismiss the cases because of either a lack of evidence or just saying that it's not violent or not important enough to, um, to do something about this. And this concerns both women who are victims and animals, which are often brought to the attention of the judicial system by women, actually, mainly by women. And a very sad element um, of this violent system is that uh, often women who are victims of violence do not go to a shelter for women because they are afraid for their domestic companions who will be hurt. Uh, many shelters do not accept animals. So women can go there with their children or alone. They can't take their dog, their cat, anybody else. Uh, so they often um, decide to stay at home with their offender to make sure their domestic animal is not killed or hurt. There is research, research that supports this as well. And these are large numbers of women victims who do this. So to sum up uh, the violence part, no, violence is universal. Um, and it is caused by the violence, um, by the perpetrator's sense of power over their victims, over their weaker victims. So the, mechani the mechanisms here are the same. Um, it doesn't matter whether women or animals are actually the victims, uh, because it is the perpetrator that has the problem with, uh, with the sense of power. So in order to end violence towards women, um, we must end all violence, because it's interconnected. And in this way, by saying this to feminists, I try to include them to at least be allies of the animal rights movement, if not to join it and be active. Um, there's another part of violence, a bit more um, difficult to talk about, perhaps, and maybe some people won't agree with this, but violence is gendered in society towards women, because more women are victims of violence than men are. But also, if you take a closer look at factory farming, um, you will see that female animals are treated differently because of their sex. And the tortures they must go through are different. Um, some of these include forced insemination, which also adds to the normalization of rape culture in society. Um, the tortures include continuous pregnancy, um, which leads to severe health problems, as you all know, and taking away babies without consideration for the mother's pain, like cows. Um, therefore, female animals are, to a different, on an even greater scale, are objectified, um, because they're not just consumed, like male animals, but they're also used as producers, as incubators, and uh, they live a life of torture and disastrous conditions. They end up on people's plates. Um, so some examples include cows and milking, laying hens, cages, pigs, and crates. Um, this is not to say that male animals suffer less, or, but this is usually, um, the suffering of female animals usually lasts longer. And the fourth and final interconnection I want to tell you about is inconvenience. So it is uh, obviously inconvenient for men to acknowledge the full equality of women, um, because if they did, they would have to change many things. This would mean fewer privileges for them and more obligations. Some of these include equal pay, parity in parliaments, um, absolutely no tolerance for harassment, uh, high penalties for violence, inevitable penalties for violence most of all, and true equality at home, so more chores for instance. And analogically, is it not the same with animals? Um, if all of us, and this I ask feminists who often eat meat who aren't vegan, um, if we accepted that animals are not just capable of feeling pain, but much, much more, that they have an internal social life, that they are complicated beings, um, would we not have to change our ways? Everything that we consume, that we wear, what we do for entertainment, um, we would definitely have to think this over. And if I talk to more radical crowds of feminists, um, I ask them if, if they fight with rape culture in society, um, maybe they should rethink consuming uh, the raped and tortured bodies of female animals and animals in general. Um, so ending the objectification of animals is not inconvenient just for some lobbies like animal products lobbies um, or for hunters, but for society in general because it would include, it would mean many, many changes uh, for all of us. Uh, for that part of us which is not vegan, which is uh, the majority of society. Just like the full equality of men and women is inconvenient, so is um, the full equality or uh, full respect for animals as sentient beings. So to sum up the talk that I give to feminists, um, the aim of both their movements is to minimize suffering uh, and to provide dignity for those who deserve it and who have been deprived of it. 
And it's not just our position in society uh, and some of the guiding values that I mentioned, but absolutely everything that we endure in society is interconnected, including objectification, language, violence, and uh, inconvenience. So we depend on one another. And uh, when I speak to feminists, I say, as your fellow feminists, I urge you to join and support the animal rights movement, um, not just in the name of solidarity, but for our very own good. And speaking here to the vegan crowd, um, I also encourage you to take a closer look at the feminist movement. Um, it's quite close to us, more close than you may think. Um, so this talk that I gave um, is something that I do often in Poland to feminist audiences, but there are also other ways that I try to involve uh, the feminist movement in the animal rights movement. Um, some of the ways I do this include uh, the Animal Center at the Women's Congress. Uh, I will talk about this in a second. Um, a ministry for animals in the shadow cabinet of this very Women's Congress, um, involving the very loud and big women's strike in some animal rights protests, uh, and inviting feminists to speak at animal rights events, uh, engaging them so that they can share their enthusiasm within their circle uh, and involve even more people. Um, and also engaging some prominent feminists and feminist celebrities as kind of faces of the movement, both internally in their circles and outside. So uh, the Women's Congress is at the moment probably the largest social movement in Poland. Um, it's famous for many things, but the biggest event that it does every year um, is a big congress, of course, with up to 5,000 attendees. Um, it consists of debates, of lectures, of workshops, uh, which are grouped into 15 to 20 centers. And these centers are from health to education, media, women in politics, anything you can think of. Um, there has always been a green center as well, which was focused mainly on ecological issues and sometimes, from time to time, would mention domestic animals um, slightly. But there has never been an animal center before, especially for farmed animals. Uh, and this year, we managed to have one for the first time. Um, it took about two years to convince the, the Women's Congress to do this, but now we do have one. Here's the logo of it. Um, and it consisted of four debates. Uh, the first one was the talk I just gave to you, but it was more in the form of a debate with celebrities and with uh, prominent feminists. Uh, the second one uh, was named How to Stop Hunters, and it was a debate with women who actually go into the forest and stand in front of the hunters uh, and disable them to hunt. We have these groups in Poland. And the third one was um, Women Against Fur Farms, um, with women from very small villages and towns who organize local protests against the fur farms and other farms, like broiler farms in their area. And the fourth one was um, once we've convinced some feminists, hopefully, to think about making better consumer choices for, for animals, a kind of step-by-step -step guide. So what to do first, how to start, where to begin. Um, and at first, during the first two minutes of the first debate, we were slightly terrified because there were about five people only in the audience. Um, so we thought it would be a big failure. Um, so we started two minutes late, and then the people kind of kept pouring and pouring in. They couldn't fit into the room. so. Um, it completely exceeded expectations, and after being very scared at first, that would be a failure. Um, I have to say we had one of the largest audiences of all the centers that year in the Women's Congress. And this means that feminists are genuinely interested in animal rights, that they are ready for this topic, and that it's a good audience to present it to and to encourage to join us in our fight. And the Animal Center will continue for the years to come. And right now, um, Okay, so that was just one example of the, uh, the Women's Congress, and I want to share some lessons learned and some best practices, because along the way, while doing this, I made many mistakes, of course, and there were some things that went well, some things that didn't. Um, so, for instance, if any of you want to do this in your countries and speak to female uh, feminist audiences or to other movements, um, if they are completely new to our topic, I wouldn't ask for everything at once. Um, because I tried this, and at first there was a big no, uh, two years ago. Um, what I did manage to achieve then was to have um, a big debate on the main stage, which was supposed to be at first about animal rights in total, um, but because I guess I asked for too much or they weren't ready yet, um, it ended up being just a, an ecological ecofeminism kind of debate where um, I was one of the speakers and had five minutes to talk about animal rights and present this talk in five minutes. So. Um, 
but uh, this actually caused uh, the leaders of the Women's Congress to open up to the topic. Um, and they said, okay, next year the Women's Congress is all yours and the animals. So that's why this year we managed to make the Animal Center and um, make it loud. And, and lots of people really enjoyed this. So I think fem the feminist crowd is very, very ready for this. Um, and a second takeaway that I would really recommend is to, even if not ask everything for everything at once, ask and ask bravely. Um, because it may seem exotic at first to a certain audience or group, um, but you could be surprised at the good reactions. And I was very surprised that we received a whole animal center to organize after just one debate, um, but it required us to ask and to be brave about it. Um, and finally, um, I would recommend finding a prominent person within the movement um, who already cares about animals and who can open some doors for you. So I've befriended um, the leader of the Women's Congress, who um, is a prominent feminist. She's, uh, she's a well-known speaker as well, and she cares for animals, but has never thought of it um, apart from domestic animals. And um, this required a few meetings, a few talks to expand her thinking to include farmed animals. Uh, and now she's actually one of um, the people who pushes for the Animal Center to continue and for this cause to be uh, mentioned wherever possible. Um, so my take home message um, to feminists, but to you as well, um, if you're a fellow feminist and animal lover, use these arguments um, that I've presented to persuade your feminist circle and your other circles to participate in the animal rights movement and vice versa. And of course, some of these arguments um, can be changed and can be used towards other movements um, because I'm sure there are many similarities with the LGBTI movement, for instance, or any human rights movement. Um, so animals need all the help they can get and all the allies they can get. Um, and encouraging other activists to join um, is much more useful, in my opinion, than just getting more people uh, to join from the streets, um, just because they already have the expertise, they have the knowledge of being an activist, um, they have the context, they have the know-how, um, and they have a kind of activist personality which helps. And research has proven that activists uh, in one field are much more likely to become activists in another just because it's their way of life and they're just more open to this. Uh, and they can connect movements and connect more people and bring more people in. So that's why it's important. Um, and yeah, like I said, find similarities and goals uh, so that we can finally end factory farming and all cruelty against animals, as well as patriarchy. Um, and this is one of my favorite offers. She says, to talk about veganism is to threaten the pillars of patriarchy. So thank you, and if you have any questions. <laughs>